Hello and thanks for joining us today. My name is Julie Cummings and today I am excited to speak with my guest, composer John Massari for Wiki24 about his music, his life, career and particularly about his experiences in scoring 24 Conspiracy, a companion miniseries to 24. Hi John, it's great to meet you. Good to meet you. Now, I've read that as a young boy, classic music scores mm -hmm. from the films mm -hmm. Journey to the Center of the Earth, Mysterious Island, <laughs> and uh, The Time Machine inspired you to become a composer. Yeah. Can you bring us back to that time in your life? <laughs> okay, so you really want me to start from the beginning. Okay, well, there I was one summer. I believe I was like seven years old. The local theater had a triple feature. I remember going to that movie theater completely in awe. Once the lights went out, I was completely mesmerized. Of course, all the kids around me were jumping all over the place and acting up. I was gawking in amazement the entire time. And I, I didn't really know what was making me do that. I was getting sensory overload, basically, from everything. The visuals, the stories. I ended up reading The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, Journey to the Center of the Earth, in addition to Mysterious Island. Now, after the triple feature was over, I went home, and I, and I was still, like, living the experience. It made a very, very strong impression on me. I remember at the time my mom had just bought a piano. You could not get me off that piano. There was something about the movie that affected me, and, of course, it was the music. I mean, it was obvious. So there I was banging on the piano, trying to recreate what I heard. I was going to be able to watch the movies again, remember what I heard, and possibly recreate it on the piano because I discovered what a chord was. Yeah. So I was basically just playing it by ear, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I've always had a huge fascination with musical instruments when I was a kid, as any kid does. I loved the guitar. Oh, really? But I never learned to play the guitar, and I never got a guitar. I got mm -hmm. a toy guitar, I think. And one time I tried to make a guitar out of a piece of wood and some rubber bands. No. But I loved to play the radio. Yeah. I was constantly <laughs> listening to the radio. I would often sneak out into the living room mm -hmm. like at 3 in the morning, yep. turn on the hi-fi, and listen to music all night long. Sometimes look in that little, that little red light that told you that you tuned into a station, and I peer into that thinking that that was a, a television screen and I was convinced I can see the silhouette of the orchestra playing. <laughs> <laughs> Where I just happened to grow up was very close to an amusement park called Knott's Berry Farm. And they used to have all kinds of concerts there. Although I didn't know it, I was watching some legends. I, I would watch Chet Atkins play. This was a, as an eight-year-old, no. and I'd sit up front and just be absolutely mesmerized mm -hmm. over Chet Atkins, the great guitarist. He used to play with bands that had that great Bakersfield sound that was a combination of country, western, and uh -huh. Mexican folk music. It, it just had a, a great feel to it. But what really caught me is the musicianship, how effortlessly they played. Ah. And that absolutely fascinated me. But back to the movies. I always became fascinated, as any kid, with fantasy and sci-fi, but more so from the musical aspect mm -hmm. of how the music translated what you saw on screen and then how it made the movie really come alive. I, I love the music. Music of Bernard Herrmann, yep. and of course the music of Russell Garcia. Later, probably like when I was about 12 or 13, with my allowance money, I was able to buy my first records. As you can imagine, the first thing I did was buy The Time Machine, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and Mysterious Island, and I must have listened to them so often, they were basically unlistenable. That made a huge impression on me. It wasn't till much later, I'd say when I was 12 or 13, where I realized what music did to me in those movies, mm. the impact that the music in those movies had on me, I want to be able to recreate that. Not every kid in the world says they want to become a film composer at age 12 or 13, because some people don't even know what that is, mm -hmm. especially at the time that I grew up. That's the impact that those films had. I was very happy. It was very fortuitous that I got to see those particular three films. Yeah, I see. <clears throat> According to Wikipedia, you played in student orchestras and rock bands, which could be seen as opposites, I guess, in terms of music styles and mm -hmm. disciplines. Yeah. What styles of music were you initially attracted to? <laughs> well, Wikipedia just happens to be very accurate yeah. on that fact. <laughs> they missed a couple of other facts that have corrected since then, but... Yes, student orchestras and rock bands are opposites. And you know what? Opposites are good. I see. I love classical music very much. I love rock music very much. I love all types of contemporary and alternative music very much. I love film music very much. It's all music. It still conveys great emotion. And to be in an orchestra, 
with very good musicians. At the time, I was a relatively good trumpet player. Really? I played trumpet. I played the contrabass. I played the French horn. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I played what's called the tenor horn or the euphonium. In the marching band, I played the bass drum. Sometimes I played timpani and tenor drum. And in jazz bands, I played piano. Uh -huh. I also played many bands where I played uh, electric piano and various keyboards. As a matter of fact, one band I actually had an accordion that I hooked up to an amplifier. And Is that right? For some reason, the accordion was the accordion wasn't a big deal uh, <laughs> when I was growing up. Yeah, that could cause you to get your ass kicked <laughs> if you were seeing a uh, playing an accordion, even if it's pumped through a. Uh, Vox Sovereign amp, but I played bass. Oh. I had a, a Fender Precision, and I, and I liked it all. I mean, in, in my rock band, we played Kiss, we played Mott the Hoople, we played David Bowie. Is that right? Uh, Deep Purple, we played Black Sabbath, we played all that stuff, and we I loved it. Uh, I used to wear earplugs, of course, because mm. uh, I knew I needed my ears to be working for me throughout my life. I loved R&B. At the time, it was called soul music. Uh -huh. I loved Isaac Hayes. I loved Billy Preston. I used to listen to their albums all the time. I, I wish I could play like Billy Preston. Loved Burt Bacharach. Kids used to tease me about it, but I just, lo I just love what he does. Uh, Frank Zappa had me sold from the second I heard it. It was just so wild and experimental, but yet accessible, ac accessible to me. I, I got to appreciate him as a person, his philosophy of being a creative force, man of great integrity, and couldn't have a better role model. Having a variety of music that you expose yourself to and perform, especially if you want to make that your business in life, that's very important. So can you tell me about the first musical instrument you learned to play, and yeah. what do you play today? <laughs> That's a very good question. Like I said, the very first instrument I played was a, a ruler with some <laughs> rubber bands <laughs> stretched across <laughs> it, and I played a Beatles songs on the radio. That was my first instrument. Then I moved on to piano, picked up the bass, the contrabass, and the electric bass. Also played a variety mm -hmm. of keyboards. I had a, a Wurlitzer electric piano. I used to get a lot of sounds out of my Wurlitzer with all my guitar pedals. Hmm. I picked up the trumpet around 14. I played the trumpet until I was like 22. I played it into college. Of course, piano. I studied piano throughout, although I am not really a pianist. No way. Sadly enough. I, I admire my composer brethren, uh, especially uh, Bear McCreary, who performs live in concerts. God bless him. Oh, that, that must be so much fun to be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I basically, what I play now is a multi-core hot-rodded Macintosh. Absolutely. <laughs> That's where I create all my music. And from time to time, I still play bass. Sometimes I play drums various percussion instruments. I love playing bass, uh, although today I play a really cool riff. I save that and I take all my cool riffs and ed edit them together and it sounds like a great bass part, but mm -hmm. uh, I would not lend myself out as a session player, let's put it that way. I, I remember uh, hearing something that Junkie XL says, he says that about his guitar playing. He's really good at playing fragments and then in Pro Tools he makes it all happen, which is, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. The finished product is what's key. Yeah, I see. Now, I understand you started working in Hollywood as an orchestrator. Mm -hmm. What were some of the mm -hmm. challenges starting in the film and TV industry? Good question. Challenges. That's an understatement. I was still studying music at UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, and studying privately mm -hmm. with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Albert Harris. Also studied at UCLA with film composer David Raxon, who was a, a very famous Academy Award winning composer that uh, there wasn't really a, a, a film composing program at UCLA. They had kind of just a, um, a lecture series, basically. Mm -hmm. My real film education came from Dr. Albert Harris, who was actively working in the industry at the time. I learned a great deal from him, probably for two years straight I studied with him, of my last year of college and then when I was out of college. But while I was in college, I think I was in my last year, I was aggressively trying to get to work as an orchestrator with other composers. Mm. I was able to get the composer Jerry Fielding and David Rose to return my phone calls. My teacher, Dr. Albert Harris, was well known in the industry, very well respected. He said he would basically tell me, okay, so you're at a point now where you should start working with guys that are really established. Here's the number of David Rose. Here's the number of Jerry Fielding. Tell them that I told you to look them up. 
Jerry Fielding, I worked for about a year and a half before he passed away, passed away far too soon. David Rose, I worked for about two years on a TV series called Little House on the Prairie. Oh, really? I just did little tiny cues, little tiny things, 15 seconds. It's a little five-second stinger, anything. I was so happy to work with him. And bit by bit, yeah. getting some experience, real hardcore experience. Uh, I didn't always get to go to the recording sessions, but most of the time I did. And the times that I did, it was a magical experience. I first large orchestra I heard in a recording studio for the first time was with Lalo Schifrin. I had mm -hmm. won the Frank Sinatra Award for Composition and Arranging. You were invited to various events afterwards, and I got to go to a recording session of Lalo Schifrin. And it was for a movie titled Nunzio. When I walked in, I thought I was in a cathedral. It sounded so magnificent and wonderful. And I said to myself, I, I, I want to do that. I saw Lalo on the stage conducting the orchestra, and everything sounded wonderful, and the musicians were the best of the best. Needless to say, I caught the bug. And I realized that I'm going to have to find people about my own age that are up and coming that are filmmakers. So that was the big challenge after you've worked with established people that they have all their established clientele, so to speak. I needed someone basically in my same set of circumstances that are working their way up. So I managed to strike relationships with a variety of filmmakers, which I think leads me to your next question, correct? Uh-huh. Killer Clowns from Outer Space mm -hmm. was one of your <laughs> first composing assignments. No, actually. Oh, it wasn't? Actually, it was not my first film. Really? Although technically, I feel like it's my first film. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I saw an interview on YouTube where you speak with great passion about mm -hmm. Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Yes. How would you yes. describe the experience of working in that film? It was the first film that I felt brought me back to that time when I was seven years old and looking at the triple feature and wanting to do that kind of music again. I was able to do that kind of music that I saw in Journey to the Center of the Earth and The Time Machine and Mysterious Island. I was able to do that in Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And I was in great company because the Kyoto Brothers spoke that language. They grew up on those films, monster films, sci-fi. Previous to that, I had done a number of projects. One in particular was the very, very first television series for HBO called the Ray Bradbury Theater. You know, just a few years earlier, I was listening to Ray as a college student, and then here I am sitting across the table from him. He's giving me direction what he wants his opening title music to his TV series to sound like. That was an incredible experience. So not too long after that, I was asked to do the wonderful world of Disney theme for the Walt Disney Company. Those were my first two projects before Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And yes, I speak very passionately about Killer Clowns from Outer Space because it was like the perfect storm creatively. Getting to work with the Kyoto Brothers on something completely different. There wasn't a movie like it at all. Well, you could probably say, because around that time, Tim Burton came out with Beetlejuice, which was a quirky sci-fi horror genre. Actually, that wasn't sci-fi. It was a quirky horror genre that, that people were attracted to. And I saw this as a similar direction or a, a similar genre, so to speak. I just put all my all into it uh, from the composing standpoint. Mm -hmm. And there are plans to record it in a much different way. Uh, stay tuned for that. Ah, absolutely. People love the sci-fi genre, which is why Killer Clowns becomes a beloved cult classic. However, a lot of people don't seem to tune into the sci-fi genre. Mm -hmm. As someone who was instrumental in the branding of Killer Clowns, what would you say to both groups of people? I would say, learn to get along. <laughs> Not everyone's going to love everything. Yep. I realize there are people that are into the comic book genre, all the superheroes and what have you. Some people are into deep science fiction, things that are mm -hmm. very technical, very deep, uh, not very accessible, so to speak. For instance, 2001 A Space Odyssey. I love it. I get it. I read all the books. There are some people that come away from the books and all those movies with nothing. Killer Clowns is sci-fi. Killer Clowns is also horror. Killer Clowns is also comedy. Yep. Killer Clowns is also can be kind of gross. Okay. Clowns are not for everyone. No. But for the people who don't really like clowns that are scared of them, yeah. this is a movie that you can overcome your fear of clowns and you can laugh at yeah. them <laughs> and you can also run away from them. Over the years, the success is due entirely 
to the wonderful fans all over the world that have discovered that movie. It's almost like a Christmas movie, Easter or a Christmas movie. Is that right? <laughs> because during the summer it plays and during Halloween it plays. Uh -huh. There's always going to be a new generation of people that come to enjoy and discover that movie. What made working on Killer Clowns a very gratifying creative experience is working with the Kyoto brothers who the three together are a very strong artistic entity. And that doesn't happen often. I was very happy to be able to work with Stephen, Charlie and Eddie. How did you come to Fox 24's conspiracy miniseries mm. then? Well, it came to me, which I am very grateful for. I was working with my friend Eric Young, who introduced me to the Kyoto Brothers years earlier. He started his own company, Spark Hill Productions. Spark Hill produced primarily bonus features for DVDs. And of course, we didn't just do bonus features. We did full-on documentaries. There is a feature-length documentary on the making of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. 20th Century Fox approached Spark Hill Productions with the notion that they would take their premiere shows, 24, Bones, Prison Break, and they were going to do companion series for alternative media, in this case, cell phone and internet. Since I was their in-house music director, composer, post-production sound supervisor, I was very grateful to be commissioned to compose the score. Were you a fan of the 24 TV series? I did watch episodes of it prior to being offered to work on this companion series. I wasn't a fan in the respect that I would follow all the actors and follow the storylines very closely. I did admire and appreciate it, the whole concept that each show takes place over the course of an actual hour, who was very fascinating to me. Considering the popularity of Sean Callery's music, mm -hmm. how did you mm -hmm. approach your score for 24 Conspiracy? That's a very good question. And that's a very legitimate professional challenge because when I was commissioned to do the series, they asked me, are you able to copy his sound? And I said, yes, I can copy his sound. However, do you want me to copy his sound? We're glad you said that because we want you to sound like him, but we don't want you to sound like him. No way. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I sat down and I listened to a couple of soundtrack albums from the TV series in my car, not near a piano or anything, just to get the syntax, get the vocabulary, get the colors that he was going for. Then I didn't listen to anything. I didn't even watch the TV series while I was working on my TV series. I just let that sink in. I didn't want to like start copying any motifs or any themes or anything, but getting, getting the overall color and feel of the series was very important. And at the same time, I want to give it my personality. I'm wondering if you used any special equipment or instruments to create the score. Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I took it upon myself to set aside a significant amount of time. And I do this with every project where I collect unique sounding instruments, unique sounding textures, and I have that sort of as my palette. For this particular series, I really wanted to get a variety of mallet instruments that are bowed, that are played with a, a big contrabass bow. So if you can imagine, you have a marimba, and if we all know what a marimba sounds like, I'll play you an example. Okay, here he goes. All right, that's a marimba. Or what we have here is a vibraphone. You've heard vibraphone in jazz music. And imagine these instruments now played with a bow, like a violinist would play, or a contrabass. The reason why I use a contrabass bow is because it's very big and heavy duty. So they, you draw that bow across and it comes up with a very interesting sound. Here's a, a marimba bowed. All right, here is a vibraphone bowed. Okay, I'm gonna play it now. See that? That's what I used for some of my sustain sounds. And I would do various processing with them, so it's not always sounding the same. So I, I may play that sound backwards. I may equalize it in such a way where it's very thin. When someone listens to it, especially another composer, they'll try to figure out what in the world was that? And I always like that. I like that with my audience too. I like them. I love it when people say, 
what instrument was that? How did you get that sound? From time to time, we'd get a phone call and someone would ask me, I hear you did this guitar sound. What kind of amp do you use? I love questions like that. I love it when people have heard my music and they feel engaged enough that they can communicate with me to ask me how I did that or what is that sound. However, when you call it four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of tough to be uh, very alert, although I am often up at four o'clock in the morning. So those were some of the instruments. There's also Japanese bowls, which is a metallic bowl that's uh, played with a bow, or it can be struck with a, a wooden hammer or a metal hammer. So I hope that answers your question. So if we consider then that the exhibition format for this branded TV series was quite unique, mm -hmm. did you find creating the score particularly challenging or, or difficult in any way? We did a seminar for broadcasters from NHK Tokyo. And one of the things they were concerned about with this format from a visual standpoint, are you going to light things differently? Or are people going to act differently with what I do? Am I going to approach the sound differently? Am I going to write different kinds of music? Is it going to, should I be worried that it's coming out of a little tiny speaker? My response to that is that no, because I believe that you could see an epic, gorgeous, huge cinematic film on your cell phone, and it's still going to be an epic, gorgeous, cinematic film. It's the story that makes the breadth of the film come through. I wrote it as if it was going to be broadcast on television or it was going to be in a theater. Did we make it so that it translates to a cell phone, to earbuds and everything? Yes, of course we do. We uh, do that regardless. We do that. When you mix and create music, you want it to translate into all sorts of media. I treated this particular score as if it was going to be on television or the big screen. So of all the scores you've created for <laughs> film and TV, which one's your favourite? <laughs> Which, which one is my favorite? That's like saying, you know, which one of your children do you like better than the other? Uh -huh. Creating music is an experience. So maybe there's one piece of music that I may prefer over another, or maybe I would rather people hear one score over another. If I had one thing to play, what would it be? Right now, I couldn't give you that answer. For me, it's the experience. Many times I will listen to my music and I can remember the experience creating it. I remember the experience recording it, people involved listening to it the first time and their excitement, whether they liked it or they hated it. <laughs> Because believe it or not, sometimes you do something that you think is absolutely wonderful and no one connects with it. Conversely, there have been times where I thought, I like this, I, no one's going to like this, They're, no one's going to get it. I can just see myself rewriting this. I'll play the piece or the piece will work with film and then I'll be quiet, I will look around the room and then I'll see the head shake, and I go, oh my God, I'm done. And they're not shaking no, they're shaking like, oh my goodness, I love it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so those are the things I cherish. <laughs> what music do you personally prefer, and what artists mm -hmm. or bands are you currently listening to? Let me see, I've created a little list over here for you. Hold on. But as far as composers, you know, in classical music, I, I really like Stephen Mackey. Film composers that do what I do, oh gosh, there's a number of guys that I admire. You know, when I went to UCLA, uh, Jamie Horner was there, and he was just, just starting out doing student films. And I've always followed his career, and I was always amazed to see him grow and you know how he approached different scores. I love the music of Bear McCreary. I feel has kind of reawakened the appreciation for film composers, whereas before people weren't aware what the film composer was all about. Bear has been very instrumental in bringing that out. I like the work that Henry Jackman and Dominic Lewis are doing in Man of the High Castle TV series, and Nathan Barr with The Americans. Incredible music, transparent, perfect, really conveys an emotion. Mm -hmm. As far as bands go, I'm very loyal yep. to my local community. The Offspring from Huntington Beach, Linkin Park, and The Dickies. I really love the energy of punk rock. The Offspring has a lot of that influence. Hard rock, almost like heavy metal, but yet punk. I also like K-pop bands. Oh. To anyone, I can listen to them all day. No way. I can't watch their videos because it's distracting. Oh, really? As far as country music goes, I love the Bakersfield sound. I love the old classic Chet Atkins and Buck Owens. It's not for everyone. It's something that I like. I'm not saying that you guys should like it. I like it. I love Frank Zappa. Still listen to him and I miss him. Ready for your next question. Are you working on any new projects? Mm. And yeah. can we look forward to hearing <laughs> or seeing you anytime soon? Okay, so you're going to allow me to do some plugs. Yes, I am working on some new projects. I have just finished a documentary titled Crows of the Desert. 
a hero's journey through the Armenian genocide. Awesome, powerful documentary about an individual, Levon Yaktakparian. Through his actions, today there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people that are alive. That is a project that I had been involved with for the past two years that I'm very proud of. The other project has to do with killer clowns from outer space. Really? That I really can't talk a lot about. I will say that I'm looking very forward to working on it, and I work on it every day. There is also a project I'm working on called Cinematic Steampunk with Margaret Maria. She's a musician in Canada, and we trade tracks, and we create new and interesting music. It's rock, punk, with a classic music design. And it's very interesting and very unique, and I love working on it. The feedback we've been getting has been just awesome. Lastly, mm -hmm. is there any particular musician, composer, or director that you're looking forward to working with? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Okay, uh, first you asked about composer, correct? Yes. And, um, gosh, without giving it away, well, Bear McCreary. Okay, nice. I'm actually going to work with him on something, mm. but I can't really say anything about it yet. Yeah, I see. As far as director, mm -hmm. well, actually, there's a producer <laughs> that I want to work with. Again, but I think he should direct. Really? Because he produces like a director, but he never directs his projects. His name is Alex Barter. Another director I would love to work with is Andrew Davis. Mm. Andy Davis and I had crossed paths and worked a little bit together, but I would like to do a full-fledged, full-on feature film with him someday soon. And a producer also who I'm dying to work with again that I used to work with quite a bit early on in his career. That was Mike Pasternick. Mike Pasternick's a great filmmaker. And perhaps we'll hook up again. Absolutely. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. That was fun. Yes, it was. I'm so happy we had this time together. My pleasure. Let me thank everyone for joining composer John Massari and myself here at Wiki24. And please come visit me at my website, johnmassarimusic.com. Perhaps we can visit again soon? Oh, yes. OK. Thanks. Please check out our links. Until next time, this is Julie Cummings wishing the very best to all of you.